Well, we kick off our uh, Sunday of Advent today. For those of you that don't know what that is, <clears throat> it's a time we light candles. It's a time that we prepare our hearts. The title of my message today is Prepare Him Room. So I grew up in a, in a pretty, um, well, I grew up in a Presbyterian church, so we did a lot of traditional things. And then we've done them tradition-wise through life here at Bayshore. And, you know, sometimes you think in your mind, it's tradition. Oh, we're doing it again. It's Advent. It's Advent. But really, what we need to remember is, it's the preparation time of our hearts. As Andy pointed out today, that it's not about anxiety and stress that creates within our life, but it's about a combing. It's about a part that's supposed to come into place to where we open our heart, we evaluate our life, and we begin to pair him room because the coming king is being spoken in. Hope is also as the prophecy candle of which we'll light. So I'm going to light it here. Bet you're wondering which color. It's purple. So today as we light this candle of hope, Isaiah says that there is born unto us a child of God who brings light into the darkness. Who brings light into the darkness. Ooh. Sometimes the light hard, is hard to pierce. Who brings light into the darkness? Yeah. yeah. Woo. Join with me in an Advent prayer. Loving God, as we light the first Advent candle of hope, we ask for your presence to fill our hearts and our homes. May the hope of Christ's coming bring light to our darkness and renew our spirits. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so my text today, there's a couple of them. It's going to be in Isaiah 9, and it's also in uh, uh, Hebrews 10. So we kick off here, and you guys are all familiar with Isaiah 9, but usually they read Isaiah 9, 2, then they skip down to 6, and then they follow out then to 7. But I'm going to read for you all of it, 9, 1 through 7. And the reason being is because you got to know when it comes out of this statement, what was happening when this was going on. So if you look back um, at the time of Isaiah, it would be marked by war, economic oppression, and destruction. And right before the beginning of the decade, Damascus, Israel's main ally against the Assyrians, was defeated, destroyed, and captured. And the Syrian kingdom dissolved, made a province of Assyria, and the, king, the kingdom of Israel was made a vassal and was forced to pay high yearly tribute to Assyria. So now this is what's taking place here. And so in the first section here it says, nevertheless, and the reason he says nevertheless is Isaiah 8 talks about utter doom and darkness upon the land. And so then, as this word comes forth, it says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he had humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephetali. This happened in 2 Kings 17. But in the honor, he will honor Galilee and the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people were walking in darkness, have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness in light has, as light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as a people. Rejoice at a harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you've shattered the yoke that burdens them. The bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be the fuel for the fire. For us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of his greatness, his government, and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from the time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So a little backstory to Israel is when he's, when he's talking about this. He's talking about Zebulun and Nephetali, which were up in the Galilean region. And in 2 Kings, what happened was, is they chose to follow pagan gods. So God, in his judgment and his justice, allowed the Assyrian army to conquer them. So they were sitting in a place, so when he says this, that these things are changing and it's going to go back to the Galilean area, this is where Jesus' ministry was. So prophecy was fulfilled. 
When it says, by the way of the sea, this is the Damascus Road. What do you think of when you hear the Damascus Road? You think of Paul. You think of he is blinded by the light. And suddenly he comes in. This is the other fulfillment of the prophecy. And when he goes in and he says, for the day of Midian's defeat, this was Gideon. So he says, as for in the day of Midian's defeat, you've shattered the yoke that burdens them. And we know that Gideon's army was too big, so the Lord shrunk it down. So they couldn't have this massive hoo that they crushed them. But it was God that did it. So he's bringing this all about because there's so much meat here. As I was studying for this and reading through it, I'm thinking, man, where have I not seen all this? But it's God saying, listen, I am changing something dramatically. I am bringing hope. I am prophesying that there will be change that is coming. So then as he says, you've shattered it, the bar across their shoulders and the rod of the oppressor. Jesus is coming in when he states that the establishment of the government will be upon him. He crushed the yoke of tyranny over the Assyrians. When it says they were a vassal, they were subjects to the Assyrians. They paid a hefty tribute tax. They did what they said. And this is the second phase almost of slavery. But when God spoke this through the prophet, it was done. He said, this is what's coming down. So for unto you, a child is born. And on him I will construct my kingdom. If that doesn't get you jazzed up about Christmas, man, you guys are shopping too much. Because we know shopping sucks the hope right out of your wallet. So what is hope according to the Bible? Let me back up here. You know, Advent, this is very good. Advent in Latin has a meaning of a range of meanings, and it's adventus in the form of advenio, which is defined not only to arrive, to come, but also to develop, set in, and place. And in an ancient Rome, Aventus was a technical term for the glorious entry of the emperor. You know, as you, as you study into the word, you start to realize when Jesus' triumphal entry was coming, and they threw down the palm branches, and they thought, this is the king. This is what they're talking about. This was the lifestyle they were used to, the procession that went on. So as we, as we look at Advent, we look at this baby in a manger, and have you ever thought about the fact that, you know, Mary and Joseph were trucking along, and we know their story that was there. Joseph had to deal with some really big issues. I'm be, being betrothed to Mary. Now she's pregnant. Mary had to deal with some very big issues. She's going to be pregnant, and she's not married. And we know the angel came to bring them comfort and to bring them peace to be able to walk through what's going on. And then so they're called for a census to go back to the town, the first in this king's doing. So they get there, and there's no place in the inn. We all know this story really well, and we can recite it. So they're in this stable. Now, I don't know about you, and I, I didn't grow up in a livestock area, but I had one opportunity once to be able to go and take care of a pig. And I don't know if you guys have ever been around pigs. My daughter was in the Future Farmers of America thing where she had an FHA, FAA, FFA pig. She was out of town, so she asked me if I'd take care of this pig for like a week. So I roll in here to this pig. I have never been in such a horrible environment. You ever been in a pigsty? Ha, ah, pigsty, yeah. It was foul, man. But I'll tell you what, you never change your mind about eating pork. Because that, yeah, the other white meat. You know what I'm saying. So picture these guys cruising into town. There's nowhere for them to stay. So they have to stay to them in a manger. They're sent to the stable. And Jesus is born and put in a manger. So you may picture what we see on TV and everything is prim and proper and their clothes are all clean and everything's really neat. But really there's stink of manure. Maybe there was a pig. Well, Jews, Jewish people didn't like pigs, so there's probably no pigs around. So there's straw. There's dirt. There's cold. This is the environment. So when the wise men came and the shepherds came to see because of the loud thing, they didn't cruise into a beautiful stable. Jesus was kicking it back in swaddling clothes and just came out with drafts and there was no smell. It was just beautiful. No. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes that probably had blood on them. There was dirty straw that was probably stuck to Mary's garment. Joseph probably was just beat because he, he didn't know what to do. There's other animals in livestock in this place. This is the environment that God chose for Jesus, the King of Kings, to come in. And then we sing a song like the great I am. We forget that. But the part that I don't want to forget this Christmas with hope is the part that this is how it started. And we know reading how it's going to end. It's going to be glorious. 
We don't know what the sandwich filling is in between. We all deal with that. But today we're looking at hope. So what is hope? Hope is a confident expectation of the longing for the promised blessings of righteousness. But when people talk about hope in our culture, it's usually referring to a vague feeling of hopefulness. Like, oh man, I hope I can get that shirt at the mall. Oh, I hope I can find a parking spot at the beach or at UTC right now in shopping time. Good luck. That's the hope we throw out. It's a hopefulness. But you know what? The Bible speaks about hope. It's a certainty. It's a sure thing. It's a done deal. A hope that does not disappoint or put us to shame. The scriptures refer to three hopes we have as believers. One is that we hope that our past is forgiven. We all make mistakes, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and we do, the, we do and say things, we think things we later regret, and sometimes it's hard to let go of our past. Sometimes we have something that burdens that we just don't feel like we're worthy to be set free. We don't feel like, oh man, if God, if God knew my past, he, he would never forgive me. God knows your past. He knows your future. He knows your immediate. But we're, we're assured of hope that our past is forgiven. Another hope is that our present is secure. We know that if our sins are forgiven, we can have hope for today that God is present with us. Jesus was forsaken on a cross so that we would never be. Scripture says, I will never leave you or forsaken, forsake you. We have hope that our future is safe. We have a hope for the future that God is working all things together for the good both in this life and to come. Who has begun a good work is faithful to completion. Have you ever struggled with just accepting that God made you a certain way and that the journeys that you've gone through, we've, we've talked about this at different times in our lives to where what if this and this and this would have changed? What if I'd have got saved when I was two years old? You can wrestle with that one as far as the age of accountability. What if we wouldn't have journeyed? We can't live in a what if bookend. There's always a what if somewhere. What if? There's no answer. But there's assurance in the great I am. There's an assurance, and he says, for unto you a child is born. And on him will rest these things. That's our assurance. That's our hope for the future. Hebrews 10 says, uh, 10, 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have a confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through a, through a curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So when he says, therefore, anybody know what that's there for? Yeah, it's a reiteration of therefore. In light of what's happened, let me tell you what's happening. In Hebrews 10, it says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins, will, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice is no longer necessary. Therefore, brother and sisters. So we step into the assurances of what God has created for us. Now, we have the luxury of being able to look back to the prophetic side and see that these prophecies were fulfilled through the word. We saw them come to, f to fruition. But 
those of the time, the readers of the time, were looking forward. We have the, we have the great benefit of it's already done. We have the great benefit of standing in the place of the death and the resurrection. Have you ever wondered why Easter is such a great big deal and it seems like everybody really pumps up Easter and it's the death and the resurrection of Christ, but yet, as Andy pointed out, Christmas gets shoved away by the tradition of the holiday. But without the birth, there would have been no body for the death and the resurrection. The two have to go simultaneously together. The birth, the immaculate conception, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we pass through that so quickly. And then we move on to Easter. And this states right here that all these things are done. It's finished within our life. It's not us mustering up enough faith or enough courage or enough hope. It's standing in the place of hope with an expectancy that God has done this, and so I need to stand in this place because he is faithful and just to forgive, no matter what my sin was, no matter what my sin may be, because it's past, present, and future tense. And the part that Paul dealt with with the Galatians as he brought this out of the gospel was, oh man, it's future? I got a license to sin because it's covered. He said, no, 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 no. You're missing the point. And the point of it is that no matter what you do, that blood is sufficient and even greater, not to atone for, but to cover and substitute and do away with. As we read in the text, he says, they are remembered no more. So why do you remember yours? Why do you get up and live under condemnation, of which Romans 8.1 says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? We stand boldly before the throne because we've been invited and it's been provided for nothing that you and I have done, but what Jesus did. This is the hope that Advent starts to bring back to you. This is the hope that we reposition ourselves to and we look and we go, Man, why, why am I just feeling so down? Scripture says, why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. You tell yourself, up out of this. I'm going to look to the cross. I'm going to look to Jesus and what he's given me through the birth, the death, and the resurrection. That's hope. Hope that can't be stolen away. Hope that can't be stolen away because there's turmoil around our world. Hope that can't be stolen away because our life within the United States, as we know as believers, is very turbulent as far as faith goes, as far as theology goes. We live in a total cataclysmic mess. But you don't need to be hopeless because he's given hope of the risen Savior that's coming. In the text that we were looking at, it was the foreshadowing of him coming. So how do we do this? We let us draw near to God. The text says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. You're forgiven. You may sit here today and struggle with your forgiveness. You may sit here today and go, man, how can I be close to God? He's made provision for you. Today, receive his forgiveness. Your sins are forgiven. Let go of bitterness and regret. Hope in the only one that gives life. You know, so many people, as you go through a journey, you think you've let go of something, and then it surfaces, and it comes back, and it beats you down. And this is the enemy's tactic, to hold it over your head. And you don't have to live under that. You can lift your hands freely and sing out boldly that he is the great I am. He is the one and only. There is no rival to him. And you know, if you look back to the text of which we read, Zebulun and Nephali wandered away and they began to do the things. I probably pronounced those names wrong, but you know what I'm saying. And in that, we live in the same culture. We live in a culture where, well... Maybe this was accepted before, and this isn't accepted now, and this wasn't accepted then, but it's now accepted. So how do you navigate that? You navigate it by holding on to God and truth, the Word of God. It's the only place. The next one is, let us hold unswervingly to the hope. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised it is faithful. 
This is how you navigate it. You don't veer off from what the truth that was spoken to you, that you're forgiven, that you're a child of God. And that as all these other things start to pollute into, like these two tribes got polluted into, and God brought judgment on, fortunately the grace of God flows down from the cross to be able to help us to write back to the place where we're unswervingly pressing on to the faith that we possess, with the hope that we possess by the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Don't let doubt or trouble veer us off from the hope we profess. Immerse yourself in the word. The Bible is the true and living word. I saw this guy, um, he was talking about the Bible. I couldn't hear it because I, I had my sound off, but I, it was fun watching it because the subtitles came up and he was kind of an animated guy, very much like Andy. And he said, the Bible, do you read the Bible? And he's beating on the Bible. Do you read the Bible? You know, we're almost done with the Bible through in a year, right? For those of you that made it through, those of you that are still going, it's not too late. Just because you stopped at Genesis, you can make it up. Shut off the Hallmark show. Shut off all those TV shows. <clears throat> Hours, you can do it. Anyway, <clears throat> he's banging on this. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he says, what about Obadiah? You know, you go to heaven and Peter says, come on in. And then Obadiah rolls up to you and he goes, hey, how'd you like my book? And you're like, book? You know, the Bible, yeah, it's hard to understand in some aspects, but there are so many resources out there. We pumped the Gospel Project in one time up here. There's so much meat. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I got so pumped up on the study backwards into Isaiah to see what was going on that, you know, you just kind of go, wow, God. I was telling Gina, there is no reason we ever need to fear. There is no reason we never need to worry. Because if you look back through here, God in his justice brought judgment onto two tribes that wandered off and began to follow. They came under the rule of the Assyrians. They wiped out all these other things. And then on the same breath, he prophetically brought it back that I will reestablish within this nation. I will reestablish in this area my name, my kingship through Jesus. That's where we sit today. You know, there's a lot of questions on, is the end coming? Are we going to make it through Christmas? I don't know. You know, I believe that when the Lord is ready to come back, he's coming back. And I believe that as a believer in tune with the Holy Spirit, my ear will hear that trumpet blast. And I will look around and go, wow, there is no ground underneath my feet. I don't know where you sit with the rapture or not, but I'm not going to sit when the rapture comes. I'm gone. So we can wrestle about the eschatology and all those things, a pre, mid, post, and hopefully you're in one of those, because otherwise, woo, it's time to say goodbye. But as believers, we have the assurance in our heart. So I say all that because we live in a, in a world right now that is absolutely chaotic. I don't watch the news, but I do read some headlines periodically from this one that's supposed to be good. And the, the mayhem that happens in cities, the chaos, it's just out of control. And I don't know how people that aren't believers in Jesus Christ make it. Because there is no hope. If you look to the world, there is no hope. The hope lies in Jesus. So let us hold unswervingly to that hope. And the last one is, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Be a hope hero. Declare the good works of God. Remind each other of the faithfulness of Jesus and the hope that only lies in his birth death, and resurrection. This is the hope we cling to. You know, many times in Thessalonians, if I'm doing a funeral, he's talking about the return of Jesus to come back. So the Thessalonians were dealing with death. They were dealing with what about, what happens. So Paul is addressing to the fact that when this day comes and the Lord comes and returns, those that are dead in Christ will rise first, and those that aren't like us, we will follow. So, but he says in there, he says, to grieve with hope. He says, not like those who have no hope. We sit here today, and if you hail the name of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have more hope than you can put in your pocket. You have more hope than you can fill in your trunk. You have more hope to overflow it everywhere. But yet we don't exercise the faith that the Lord has given us to walk in that hope, an expectant waiting. Instead, we get all tripped out. 
we begin to worry. We begin to look at the circumstances. And maybe you're starting to think if there was a guy in the Bible, the only other one that ever walked on water, Peter stepped out and he's strolling on the water. Hey, this is right. And then he sunk because of those things around him. And, you know, we may leave here today and go, man, I am feeling good. I am feeling hope. Man, the worship was amazing. Oh, the food, man. I am so full. The business meeting was phenomenal. And then you walk out of here and you're, somebody tells you some bad news. And then phew, I can't make the noise of a balloon letting out air because it would sound like something else. And I don't want to do that in front of the church. So that's gone. And that'll happen. And that's where we stand back and we go, wait a minute here. I'm going to look with the eyes of faith to the hope that was given to me through my Savior, Jesus Christ. Because then I stand in that place where I don't have to navigate through this all tripped up. I can look and I can unswervingly hold to this no matter what circumstance comes because God says that he is for me and not against me. He says that he will never leave me or forsake me. And it all comes out of this thing that we call Christmas. Because it's the birth of Jesus. And that's the celebratory place that we stand. Be a hope hero. Be a hope hero. Declare his birth, his death, and his resurrection. Those three things are the gospel. So if you came in today going, man, I wish I knew how to share the gospel, you can leave here and share the gospel. That's the great thing. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I know it's a change. We're doing a little audible here. They're like, what? You told us you weren't going to have a closing song. Yeah, well, I talked a little fast, and we got done early. You know, and I know you guys are sitting there. You're hoping. You were hoping that I wouldn't be long-winded because we have a business meeting following, and there's some food prior to that. So you were like, oh, anticipation of wait. Man, I hope he can shut it down. Well, you know what? The Lord was listening to your hope. Because uh, we finished, and I, I hope that you can walk away with a nugget, that you can walk away with the light that shines into the darkness, that dispels the darkness and the gloom, that can only bring us peace, that can only give us the love of Christ to flow through us. And no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, we cling to this hope because he doesn't change. He's the same today, tomorrow, tomorrow yesterday and forever. And that's the place we sit. Would you stand with me and join with me in prayer? God, we thank you. Because, you know, we can put our hope in a lot of things and be let down. We can put our hope in a lot of stuff and be disappointed. But we put our hope in Jesus. We are not disappointed. We are not dismayed. We are not let down. We are held up. We are carried when we can no longer walk. We can stand when we are faint. And most of all, Lord, we can hope in you because you have done away with the things that have separated us from you because of your son, Jesus, our Savior, that on that cross made a way that we could come boldly into your presence. And we have the benefit of hoping in his second return, in his comeback, the second coming of Jesus is where we sit. And Lord, may you use us to be hope heroes on this earth as we walk these days that are left, that we don't know how long they are, but you do, and we trust you in that. Lord, we love you and we give you our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.